The large intestine is an important part of the gastrointestinal tract to know about as a medical student and a doctor. It is roughly 1.3 meters long and contains unique structures, which include the tiny coli, haustrations, and appendices epiploicae. Its function can be remembered by the crude mnemonic AS, which stands for A, absorbs water and electrolytes, S, stores food residue for elimination, and S, secretes mucus for feces lubrication. Important clinical conditions to know about include colorectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and UC, polyps, and acute problems such as bowel obstruction, bowel perforation, and ischemic bowel. These conditions will be covered in another video. Tinea coli are three bands of visible longitudinal muscle. They are the tinea libra, which is not attached to the mesentery. There's tinea mesocolica, which is medially attached and ascending and descending colons, and tinea mentalis, which is anteriorly present in the transverse colon. Haustrations are pouches of bowel formed by contraction of smooth muscle, and appendices epiploicae are fatty tags attached to the serosa layer. The gross anatomy of the large intestine can be divided into several groups. We start with the cecum, which is an intraperitoneal pouch-like structure that is in contact with the anterior abdominal wall, and it may cross the pelvic brim to cross the true pelvis. The ileocecal valve is an important structure of note. It connects the terminal ileum of the small intestine with the large intestine and prevents reflux from the cecum to the ileum. Therefore, it regulates the passage from ileum to cecum. The vermiform appendix is suspended from the terminal ileum by the mesoappendix, and it's usually posterior medial to the cecum. Its function is believed to be immunological as it contains lymphatics and the location of the appendix varies. Clinically, the appendix presents as appendicitis that may require medical treatment or surgical removal. This will be covered in another video. The colon itself is composed of the ascending, transverse and descending sigmoid colon. Ascending and descending parts are retroperitoneal whereas the rest of the colon and cecum are intraperitoneal. The ascending colon has an anterior surface, which is present, and covered by the peritoneum and attached to a posterior abdominal wall. Superiorly, we have the hepatic flexure, which is the location before the liver where the ascending colon turns into the transverse colon. Transverse colon is intraperitoneal, and we have a transverse mesocolon, which connects the colon to the posterior wall of the abdomen. It is continuous with two posterior layers of greater omentum, and it's the largest section of the large intestine. It ends at the splenic flexure, which is generally higher than the hepatic flexure. Then we have the descending colon, which is retroperitoneal, and it goes from the splenic flexure to the sigmoid colon. Then we have the sigmoid colon, which is intraperitoneal, and is suspended by the sigmoid mesocolon, which contains lymphatics, colic vessels, and autonomic nerve fibers, as well as extraperitoneal fatty tissue. Its function is to link the descending colon with the rectum. This is also the site of diverticuli. Then we have the paracolic gutters on either sides of the ascending and descending colon and the posterolateral abdominal wall. These structures are clinically important as they allow fecal material that has been released from inflamed or infected organs to accumulate in these sites and prevent them from going elsewhere in the abdomen. This is clinically important in appendicitis and burst appendix surgery. Then we have the rectum, which starts at the S3 vertebrae and is a 15 centimeter muscular tube. It goes from the sigmoid to the anal canal. It starts intraperitoneal, becomes retroperitoneal as it descends into to pelvic floor and anal canal. Its function is that it's an expandable organ for temporary storage of feces and it allows the movement of fecal matter into the rectum upon defecation. The anal canal originates from the lower level of the rectum and extends to the anus. It is below the level of the pelvic floor. The dentate line is an important junction. It's a squamal columnar junction which differentiates from the outside and the inside. There's an internal anal sphincter which contains smooth muscle and an external anal sphincter which contains skeletal muscle. Internal anal sphincter is responsible for involuntary control, whereas the external sphincter is voluntary control as it is skeletal muscle. Finally, there's the epithelium changes. The importance of these is in regards to anal cancer, as it helps determine resection margins for the surgeons. Above the dentate line, we have columnar epithelium. Below the dentate line, we have stratified squamous epithelium. And beyond the anus, we have the keratinized squamous epithelium. The blood supply of the colon is determined by the embryological structures of the midgut and hindgut. The midgut goes from the sphincter of OD in the duodenum all the way to the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. The hindgut starts at the distal one-third of the transverse colon and goes all the way until the rectum. The two main arteries are the superior mesenteric on the right side of the colon and the inferior mesenteric for the left side of the colon. The superior mesenteric artery has several branches. The iliocolic artery, which supplies the cecum and the same in the colon, the right colic artery, which supplies the ascending colon and transverse colon, and the middle colic artery, which supplies the transverse colon up to the two-thirds. On the left side, we have the left colic artery, which supplies the distal one-third transverse and descending colon, 
the sigmoid artery, which supplies the descending colon and the sigmoid colon. And then we have rectal arteries, the superior, middle, and inferior. These are branches of the IMA and internal iliac. We also have the marginal artery, which goes all the way around. It is an anastomosis of all these arteries mentioned, and it ensures collateral supply for the bowel. The venous drainage of the bowel is very similar to its arterial supply. Think about it as a corresponding vein to the artery. So in the right colon, we have the ascending colon, which drains into the iliocolic and right colic veins, and the transverse colon, which drains into the middle colic. In the left colon, we have the descending colon into the left colic vein, and the sigmoid colon drains into the sigmoid vein. The right colon drains into the superior mesenteric, and the left colon into the inferior mesenteric vein. The inferior mesenteric then drains into the splenic vein, and the splenic vein is superior mesenteric drain into the portal vein. The portal vein goes through the liver sinusoids, and after metabolism, they enter the hepatic vein. The hepatic vein drains into the inferior vena cava, which then enters systemic circulation. And here we can see the arteriovenous diagram of the blood supply as described. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something. If you want to like and subscribe, it would be greatly appreciated.